Welcome, welcome to episode one of the Tech We Want podcast. My name is Greg. I'll be the host today. Uh, the Tech We Want podcast is where we interview creators and founders of some of the coolest technology around the world that we've been able to find. And today we're here with Nick Leeson, co-founder of the Lift, uh, Lift Foils. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. Yeah, thanks for having us here. We're actually sitting here in the shop, in the Lift shop. Uh, where they actually assemble uh, these these boards and these e-foils. Um, so Nick, tell us a little bit more about the hydrofoil and uh, the e-foil. The hydrofoil and the e-foil. So, I mean, for those that are not familiar with hydrofoils, they are wing keels that, in our case, they go underneath our surfboards, but they're also used in boats. Um, you know, you might have been on a ferry that's on hydrofoil, so it actually lifts up over the water. And maybe you've seen, like, the America's Cup sailboats. Um, that they're lifting up over the water on these on these carbon fiber wings, and in our case, we're out surfing over the water, both catching waves and um, electrically propelled. But these hydrofoils, they they act like little airplanes underwater, so that as you start moving forward, you generate enough lift to lift that board off the water, so that you're no longer skipping along the surface; you're flying over it, and so it's this unique sensation of both flight through the air, but also surfing through the water because you very much have the feeling of those wings gliding through the water Then you feel that in your feet. So you have that, you have that combination of pushing off the water like a surfboard, but also flying over it, you know, through the air. So it's just, it's the coolest thing you've ever done. Yeah. And for those of you that are watching on YouTube, we're going to, we're going to be overlaying uh, some video. Uh, so our channel tech we want we did a review of the lift efoil last year um, we were actually one of the first channels on YouTube to review it and uh, when we had a ch we had a chance to check it out and immediately after we had to buy one um, because it's such an incredible product and so that's the latest product that lift came out with uh, the efoil um, but Nick tell us a little bit more about yourself your background and then also the company because I know you guys have been around for for quite some time yeah, we've been around for about 10 years. Um, I'm a simple guy, so born and raised in Puerto Rico uh, with, to an American family uh, that moved down here many, many, many years ago. And so surfing has been a lifestyle in our family, and we grew up with a board in our hands, you know, like my dad was pushing us into waves when, we, when I was four um, and got a windsurfer as soon as I could hold on to a sail. And as soon as kites came out, we were out kite surfing. Um, so we've, we've been really big into the sports and we'd even travel into the winter and, you know, do the skiing, snowboarding, but very sports active, um, focused around surfing. And I went out to school in the States. I studied mechanical engineering primarily too, cause I really wanted to understand how a wing works. I was always fascinated with like my sails on the windsurfer and I did a lot of racing and just, you know, you'd fine tune your sail and it would just change the feeling completely. And, but you didn't really fully understand what was going on, you know? And, um, and I loved physics, I loved math, and so I went out and studied engineering and kind of deep down inside, I was like, I always loved flight, you know? I love the things of wings and learned a lot of stuff in school that were not necessarily related to that, but also learned, you know, a lot of aerodynamics and stuff too and um, came, back, came back home after school because there's no place like home and came back to the ocean and discovered hydrofoils. There was, um, it was just, it was just starting to touch into the world of kite surfing. Yeah. So um, there was a, a brand that had launched, it was called the Carafino. And it was, um, it was a first, it was a good first attempt of making like a, a c composite carbon fiber hydrofoil for kiting. Um, but it was, you know, it was a first attempt. And so there was a lot of things that were, that were wrong about it, but people were flying around. And there was just a couple of them out there, and um, we got our hands on one, and I just totally fell in love with it because I was like, "This is it, you know? You're, you're, you're flying, you're surfing. It had composite construction, which was a, you know, a, a big interest for me, and it had hydrodynamics, aerodynamics, surfing, you know, design. It just, it was so alluring, you know. It just pulled me straight in, yeah. um, and so we got started working on that and we we actually started a company 10 years ago I started it with my dad you know I'd, I'd come out of school and I was looking for a job and my dad was toying around with the idea of building a, a surfboard factory it was kind of a passion project for him but he didn't want to really drag me into that because he's like no you got to go out and get a real job a real job go, come on get real like I don't know if, you know 
don't want to limit your your abilities there but i was like man the surfboard factory sounds kind of cool that sounds like fun and um and i actually did um i i got a real job in the doing the industrial wind energy here on the island but the day that the first day that i sat down at the desk you know i had like my monkey suit on i was like nope so how long did that last oh i no i did it for over a year but day one i i sat down and i was like absolutely not like this is not for me you knew that wasn't going to be the long term no way that's that same day i was like okay here's what i got to do i'm going to work this job during the day and at night i'm going to work on a hydrofoil like i got to just build one for myself and i have to like just set up the project and i knew that i had to learn you know more about aerodynamics hydrodynamics i had to learn about composite uh, molding and constructions i had to learn cnc machining i had to learn um how to put this thing together. CAD design, you know, that's and Where'd huge. you learn all this? Uh, just by doing it, um, getting, just jumping in. I mean, you know, what you learn in engineering is not necessarily like how to solve every problem, but you know, you learn how to structure a problem. So you say, okay, this is where I want to get to. And this is what I, like, what are the things that I need to get to that, you mm-hmm. know, final goal? Then you break it down into a list and you start, you know, taking it off one bite at a time. And so we, I jumped into it literally 10 years ago. And um, we, I started working on it just more like after work um, in, my, in my living room, learning CAD designs and putting together the first, you know, models. And, and my dad, he, he kind of jumped in, you know, when I started getting into it, he was like, all right, well, if we're going to do this, let's, let's do it right. Mm-hmm. You know, let's, let's put together a small factory. And he actually bought a machine for building surfboards. So kind of two, two separate subjects. But we, we had a surfboard, uh, but it was an awesome CNC machine. And we were cutting some of the biggest boards in the world. And we were making, you know, we really focused in on the SUPs when that was kicking off. And we were building high-end race boards for sub, you know, and there were full carbon fiber, custom paint jobs, beautiful boards. Mm -hmm. So we had these, you know, 14 to 18 foot boards coming out of our shop. And then on the other side, we had our hydrofoils, you know, for flying with a kite. So like two very unique products in the market at that time. And we were getting good at, at building each one of them. And this is way before the e-foil and and propulsion and all that, right? So that came a little bit later. Tell us a little bit more about, I know you guys had some setbacks, right? With uh, with the company, there was uh, obviously in Puerto Rico, there's been some hurricanes, but then you guys also had a, a fire, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, we started and we, we incorporated in 2010 and we set up the factory in 2010. And, um, and we, we built, I, I really built foils day in and day out for, for years. Like I was here in the shop building everything from scratch and just learning about wings, learning about wing design, learning about the construction, just five years, day and night, no breaks, no weekends, no nothing. It was just obsession, complete obsession. And 2015, we, um, we started off on the e-foil project like that, that kind of came in, you know, mainframe into my mind. And I was like, you know, once it gets stuck in there, it's like, forget how, it. How did you obsession. come up with the idea? I, I mean, I have to ask, like, because, you know, some people will say I'm taking a shower and next thing you know, in the shower, it just like, boom. But like, how did, how well, did you come up with it? there was a little bit of that. And I mean, one was, um, I had a friend of mine who's a really creative guy, um, lives in the islands. He likes to tinker a lot, like built his own sailboat. And he called me up one day and said, Hey, I want to put one of these, um, I want to put like a motor on them, on one of your foils, you know? And he was, he was looking at a couple things and we jumped into this conversation of like, is it possible and, and how much power would it take? And like, you know, you, like, are there components out there that can actually do this? How are we going to control this thing? And we just, we just had kind of a brief conversation about it, but it was kind of like one of those, like almost like a harebrained idea. Just kind of like, Hey, you know, it'd be cool if we did this and that, yeah. and, but it'll but never it, work. But it definitely, it got me thinking, you know, de- like, you know, it was, it was kind of like, ah, oh, it would be interesting if you could actually pull that off, you know, but it got me thinking it was kind of on the back burner though. And, you know, it kind of fizzles out like a lot of ideas like that. People are always saying, Oh, I had that idea, but they didn't really follow through with it. Right. And, and for me, uh, I actually, yeah, I was, I was traveling. I was in the mountains in a altered state of mind. Yeah. And, um, and it, man, it, it hit. It all started coming together. We were hiking up in the Alps and, and I was like, I just saw it clear as day what this product was going to be. And um, like just, you know, because once you really visualize it, once you can see it in your mind, then it becomes like a reality. Yeah. And it's like, okay, yeah, this is, this is going to be something. Right. This is going to be cool. This is going to be awesome. This is going to be really cool. You know, like, and I just started really visualizing, seeing like what this could be. And like, all right, I got to, I got to dig into this thing. And I, you know, and it was, it was uh, quite the trip. 
Yeah. And um, I came back home and I just said, listen, I know we're going to have to sacrifice part of the business that we have now in order to build this. I don't know how to build it. I'm going to go out on the quest to like figure out how all this stuff works and see like what we can put together. But I know I need to focus a lot of time and energy on this. And we, we like, we got to do this because I, I saw the future. It's going to be good. You know, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and we did. I mean, I went out and just started looking at, I started kind of in the hobby world on like motors and stuff and, and see kind of what was available, but it wasn't, you know, we, we were able to put together like a, a prototype to prove the concept. Yeah. What did that look like? It looked pretty, you know, it was a garage project for yeah. sure. I mean, but we took, you know, we took stuff that we had in the shop and before we go like crazy building into like, you know, expensive items, let's just see if we can't slap something together that works, you know, and see if like this is even possible. And, you know, where are we, what are we missing? It was kind of like first, first attempt. So we took like one of our old racing kite boards and we routed out a big pocket in there to like put the batteries and stuff. And I got some custom hobby batteries built and I, we customized some motors and stuff like that. And I had like this full array of propellers and stuff like from these tiny little ones. Like we, we had no idea, like what, what's the size of the prop? Where's this motor going to go? Like what, how much power do you actually need? What are the RPMs? What kind of voltage do you need on the battery is like, you know, what kind of cables, what kind of connectors, what kind of this, like, you know, where's all this stuff going to set up? Yeah. It was like, it was totally unknown because there was no reference on, on how to build this. It just so no exist. one, no one had built any kind at that point. Cause I know there's other s- electric surfboards out there and there was also gas powered surfboards that there have been was around for a little like while. So, gas powered surfboards so did you time. look at those at all? And, and, or did you just nope. kind of take it from a fresh slate? Super fresh. Yeah. Nice. And that's kind of how we do things in here. Um, for the better and for the worse. Yeah. Um, you just don't get, uh, cause you know, once you see something too, it can, it can really pull you down a path. It's hard to like get it out of your mind, mm-hmm. um, but when you're when you're taking a fresh approach, it can be more difficult, but it can also like lead to more creative items. You know, like thinking outside the box. Nice. And so we, we do that a lot with our designs in here. Um, but yeah, we the the first prototype was it was pretty rough, man. But I got that first ride, and I was like, okay, this is really something. off the first one. It worked. Like no, describe to me no, the first no. ride, or like the think. first couple let me, rides. Let me think because I want to say like the first one just didn't go we had to come back and remodify a couple things did and, it um, sink did you guys lose any boards no you know I, I ended up blowing up like um the electrical contacts because we were just drawing way too much amperage um and it just it just fried the cables that we had on there so we were really like we were really like overpowering the the batteries and the and the infrastructure like the cables and the connectors and, and where'd you put together. the bat where'd you put the battery I put it inside the board and we just made a seal and we, we locked it all. Do you have up. any like pictures or anything that we can, uh, you can send us? We'll, 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 we'll put stuff on the, on the YouTube of, of any like we, first generation, like prototypes just to see how I how do. I do. I do have a video of like our, of our first ride. All right. We'll try uh, to pull that up. And if we find it, we'll, we'll, we'll overlay it on the, uh, on the YouTube here. Um, but Nick, tell me a little bit more. Cause there's a lot of, com- yeah. there's a lot of components in this. Right. And so with the early prototype, obviously there's electronics, there's propulsion, there's software, there's battery, there's the, handheld remote right Mm -hmm. so you guys had to in the beginning it sounds like you guys used a lot of whatever you could find but tell me a little bit more about the development of the product right how do you how do you go from prototype to a final product and you guys when when you launched this product it was you guys had them built and ready to go right i mean it was like there was pre-orders but it's not you guys did an indiegogo campaign no so it was it was a lot more complicated than i than i anticipated and that I thought I, I really I, I just didn't know what I didn't know you know and I was I had way too much confidence uh, in myself and the reality is it was, it was really challenging actually because you think oh it's got an electric motor and the battery pack and what's the big deal well it's kind of complicated and um, you know the the first challenge was going out and finding the people that were really good at what they do so like I'm not a motor designer and I'm not gonna get really good at designing the intricacies of an electric motor better to go find somebody who's really good at that and get them, you know, involved in the project. Same thing for batteries, same thing with a lot of stuff on there. Right. And so going out and building your team of people and because that product didn't exist. Right. They were like, you want to build a flying surfboard? Like what? Yeah. People thought you were crazy. Well, they just, they just didn't want to invest the the time into it because they thought it was like some, some kid in the working out of, you know, in a shop and tinkering with some idea and, you know, if it doesn't like, work, then have, you know, I'm, if you're really good at what you do, you're busy. Right? right. And so like these guys are busy and they're like, look, I don't have time for you. I'll pay you. You know, I'll give you the money. And they're like, ah, I just don't, they just didn't really fully believe in it. 
until you know i had to get enough components put together and enough like good looking prototypes and videos to show them the the visual of like what it is that we're putting together and then they're like okay that's cool all right i'm in you know and and so it took a lot of iterations and getting those people together to put that together and it took a lot longer than than what we expected even when we um when we launched the product when we put it out there and we had a good you know we had a good little plan for for getting it out there i mean my idea was you know, the motorized surfboards have been done before. Gas-powered mm -hmm. surfboards have been done before. Never been successful. Really, truly successful. And we need to change the way that that's being presented. Why is that? Why, why were they never, like, great, amazing products? Because they always, like, from my perspective, it always, like, lacked something essential, you know? Um, you know, you had, like, I'll, I'll give a good example. Like, the, there was a, the Wave Surfer or... Case in point, can't even remember their name, but they um, Wave Jet or something, and there, that was a good. There was a good company there, and they had a nice. They had a nice board build. They had a good construction. They had this pod that clicked in the bottom. They had the marketing. They had the rider. They had the whatever. But the thing went like five miles an hour. You mm -hmm. know, it didn't actually do anything. So I'm like, what are you guys? You know, you had a good setup, but you, you missed kind of like an essential point of like you, powered surfboard doesn't have any power. Mm -hmm. You know. And then you have these other boards that were like really powered up, like gas engine surfboards. There's some stuff from like, I think like the seventies where there was like full on, you know, 30 mile an hour, like functioning powered surfboard. But maybe it looked uh, kind of dorky, you know, like maybe it just kind of looked like a little weird and odd and just not presented by the right people in the right way. Like you didn't capture people's imagination. And so like, yeah, sure. You sold a couple boards, but it never really went anywhere. Right? Well, not only that, but the gas stuff, I mean, Anyone who has a jet ski or a boat knows the amount of work that you need to that goes into it, right? I mean, I can imagine one of these boards, if it goes under, water gets in, the carburetor. I mean, mm -hmm. now you're tinkering with it for an hour to get it up and running again, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, and that, but you know, some of the boards that I'm talking about are before batteries were really where they're at today. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was what was available to them, right? Um, and the then you talk about product like the the jet surf, right? Uh, which they were actually probably the most, the first successful company to build a powered surfboard as a gas engine. But yeah, like you say, like, man, you got to be a gearhead to really enjoy that thing because it goes underwater, which is going to happen on all the time. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, you're like flushing out some carburetor and you're like pulling parts, you know, pulling things apart to dry them out. And like, you got to love it. Like, you just have to love taking that thing apart. And if you're not into that, then that is not for you. And, and that's where they were really limited too. like they actually made it kind of cool thing was going fast but it was noisy some people like that some people don't i don't but um you know they were they were first kind of they showed success in the market i'll give yeah. them that you know what i mean um and what we did when we put it out there we i i was like look let's let's paint the picture of what this thing can do let's let's this is about exploring this is about quiet this is about like you're flying over the water it's totally unique you should be in a really unique area so we went through the neighborhood here in puerto rico I mean, we got spots 15 minutes away that are just like awesome terrain and let's film it right. And let's, let's, let's capture people's imagination, you know? And that's what we did. We launched it and we actually, you know, we, we had no idea what we were really getting into, but that went mega viral. I mean, we had like a hundred million hits between everybody sharing it, you know, like some of the, some of the bigger channels, they were getting like 30 million hits each. Wow. You know, because so people had never seen this before, right? It captured, it before. like you said, it captured people's imagination of how does it work? I mean, that's probably one of the things that, so we ended up buying one, as I mentioned, we, uh -huh. we reviewed it and I got to say the, the sensation of riding an e-foil. And by the way, I'm not a surfer. Um, I do snowboard and uh, we do ride, you know, electric skateboards, like the boosted boards and all that. Um, so we are kind of familiar with having a remote and, you know, a motorized like board, but certainly not a surfer have never been on an, on a hydrofoil before. And, the first experience on an EFOL was like nothing else because there's just so much going on. I mean, you've got, you know, the, the, the surfboard, you've got, you know, the remote, you've got the propulsion, then just even getting up on the board and feeling the, the confidence. But then once you're up, even just surfing around without even being on the, you know, on the foil is a pretty cool sensation. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of like friends and family that have ridden it, even just laying down and, and feeling like the speed that you can get, you know, most people have never even been on a, on a motorized um, surfboard of any kind, right. right? And so it's this crazy new sensation. Then once you're up on the foil, that's a whole nother experience, right? I mean, it's it's like nothing else, and it requires a lot of concentration. And uh, what what you know, I from my riding and from uh, friends and family that I get into it, 
you know, what's really cool about the eFoil is you'll spend 30 minutes, 45 minutes, like a whole battery, right? Which will last you sometimes upwards of an hour to two hours. And it feels like it's been 15 minutes. Like it just, like you, time goes by, like an hour and a half goes by and you look at it and you look at your clock and you're like, wow, I've been out here for an hour. It feels like 10 minutes because you're so concentrated. Everything else disappears. And that's what's really cool about this product is that, you know, when you're on it, it just really takes you into like the, the a mindset. Meditative yeah. state. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is, it is a great form of meditation. I, I find that about hydrofoiling that I really like, and I think that that's one of the parts that's really addicting for people and they don't actually realize it, is that you have to be present in the moment. You have to be focused on what you're doing. You have to like turn off everything else. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's not the difficult thing to do. It's not like, you know, you don't have to be a, a pro yogi or something. Mm-hmm. You're just, you're just focused. And like one of the things that I do when I'm taking people out and teaching them is I remind them to breathe through their nose. Yeah. Just relax and breathe. And as soon as they do that, you just see their posture come up right and they lock in and all of a sudden they're flying and the smile comes on their face, you know? And so you do that. That's a great way to go out and meditate. Yeah. That's a great way to go. Like just like cleanse yourself and just like lock in and enjoy, man, it's so quiet and smooth. And then, yeah, you got electric propulsion, which is, you know, a lot of people aren't familiar with electric propulsion, but like whether you're on a skateboard or a Tesla or whatever, it's so smooth and so linear and so responsive that it really feels like, you know, if it's done properly, it feels like an extension of your, of your body. You know, it's what immediate. I mean? Yeah. It's yeah, you're immediate. right. It's it, just it like feels you, connected. You start to move your finger, you know, on the throttle, like you just start to react. You're not really thinking about it. You're just reacting and, and the boards reacting to really what your, what your body's sensing. Yeah. And so you're, you're just connected with this vehicle. It's pretty cool. But let's talk about that a little bit more, Nick, because I know that there's a lot that goes into it. And as we're talking about the mm-hmm. propulsion, the software, the battery, right, there's a, there was a lot of uh, R&D that mm-hmm. went into this. So, you know, maybe we'll start with, let's start with the electronics. Like, you know, how, how, do you, how did you guys find and all the components? How did you, you know, you mentioned you worked with, you know, finding people that know how to do it and mm-hmm. partnering with different companies. I know that a different company makes the battery. So tell me a little bit more about everything that goes into the e-foil and how you guys built it and how you guys right. put it well, together. Well, I mean, like, like I said, I mean, the, the first part, it was really coming up with the architecture of mm-hmm. the product. And that's, you know, now, now there's more competition and stuff out there, but everybody's following the same architecture that we set. Um, and it's like, it was like, okay, how much, you know, how much power do we need? Like what, what kind of diameter on your propeller? Like what's that propulsion look like? Where's it going to sit? Like what are the wing sizes? Like all that stuff. And um, cause you, you have all these, avi- you have these items available. You have batteries out there. You have controllers and well, motor controllers and stuff like that. But like, man, we have to fine tune this into a craft that we really enjoy that suits our needs. You know what I mean? Like that we want to get the feeling that we're looking for, you know? Um, and that that takes a certain configuration. And then, and we really had to put it together like, okay, to get that configuration, we had to custom build all these components and they had to interact with each other properly, you know? So now we, we brought in these different people from these different teams. Now everybody needs to work together and we're going to, we're going to dictate what that needs to do and what that needs to feel like, you know what I mean? To get everybody in line and make sure that like it's working. And that's a challenging process, yeah. you know, oh, man, it, it took a lot hard. of work. It took a lot of work. And then, you know, there's the there's that aspect of it, which is that, that architecture that I talk about, but then there's a the reliability and robustness aspect of it. Cause you and got safety. all these, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, which, you know, is goes hand in hand with reliability too. It's just, um, you got all these electronics, you know, you got these sensitive pieces of equipment. I mean, we're talking circuit boards, battery cells, um, you know, uh, copper winding, stuff like that. All that stuff going in the salt water, getting crashed around by some big people having fun and stuff. That's not an easy, like they really counter, um, contradict each other, Mm -hmm. you know? And so it was a, it was a real design challenge. And then you got to package it into a small space, right? So like, okay, we got to make all this stuff really compact and strong. You know, it's got to be really durable, reliable. So like all those things, like they, they work against each other in the design world. And that's really the challenge is to find that balance of like the right place to be. And it took a lot of iterations. It took a lot of work. And especially because we really didn't have reference of anything else mm-hmm. out there. We were building it. We were, we were cutting the path, paving the way. You're inventing, right? So there's a difference mm-hmm. between, between invention and, and just building, you know, in, the, in this world where of apps and, um, you know, software as a service, a lot of times, you know, there's obviously some invention, but a lot of it is just coding, right? They know, and like you said, there's already reference points, right? 
when Lyft created, you know, their platform, they was already maybe another platform like Uber to look at so they can reference things. When you're inventing from scratch, I mean, you're just building it. Mm -hmm. You know, you have nothing to reference and nothing to build on. And so that invention, but it seems like you guys did it fairly quick. No, uh, I mean, well, maybe. We put a lot of hours in and it was like pretty obsessive behavior. So, you know, we started in 2015 um, and we, we didn't start delivering product until 2018 like summer 2018 yeah but three years i mean three years is is three years plus the additional five years of really building mm. boards and hydrofoils because that you know those five years can be easily overlooked but man let me tell you i spent a lot of hours in the shop building a lot of different wings i could decorate this whole building with wings that we put together and just like what does this do what does that do what does this do what does that mm -hmm. do as we were really developing hydrofoil like the kiting world what, what we we're surfing on today we were at the forefront of that um, really early on. We were one of the first companies to really establish ourselves. And of the original companies, we are the only ones left. You know, the Frenchies and stuff, they're, they're, they're long gone. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of work that, you know, process one was hydrofoil design and the composite construction. Process two was the electronics, you know, electrification of this, of this product. Mm -hmm. So it really took all the years. And now, and that even continues, you know, like, okay, so we, we started delivering product in 2018. Now we've shipped a couple thousand of them. And even in that process, there's a lot of fine tuning and, and modifications to make it really, really robust and reliable that like, hey, these things, I want them going out the door and I never want them to come home. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, we've been, we used ours for an entire summer, haven't had any problems. And, you know, we were not being careful with it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was interesting because I had one of my friends tell me, he's like, you know, you're just letting anyone just, just ride this thing. And, you know, it's not a cheap piece of, uh, of equipment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the reason being is one, I really want to let people experience it because it's an incredible experience, right. To even get to ride it. And that most people don't even have, right. This is still, you know, we're starting to see more places have, uh, rentals. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more of kind of where, where they're around, around the world, because now you guys are shipping a ton of them and they're getting mm -hmm. the hands of way more consumers. Um, but giving the people the experience is great. And to me, I love doing that. I love kind of sharing the tech, right? That's what we're called tech. We want, we want to yeah. find the coolest tech and share it with the world. Um, but then also the fact that I'm not worried about this thing breaking down. Like I know that I know how it's built and when people are just like ripping on it and, and, you know, smashing the hand controller against the board and they're like worried after like, Oh, there's a little scratch there. I'm like, don't worry about that. The yeah. thing's carbon fiber and it's durable as hell. So tell me a little bit more about that, like the durability and how strong these things are. Yeah, they're they're pretty tough. I mean, you want to respect your your product and, and try to take good care of it. But I'm like you, I, I actually abuse, I abuse my product because that's part of my job, right? Yeah. Like how much can this thing take? I don't want to baby it. That doesn't tell me anything. So I, I throw it in the back of my truck. I take it out in some really wild surf breaks. I've lost it on the rocks in the, like I've seen it just get pumbled in the surf against some really sharp rocks that you can't even walk on. Came out really good. I'm like, wow, <laughs> that thing's tougher than I thought. You know, like that thing is great. It's got to be a good feeling. Yeah, really good feeling. I, like, well, I did. I lost it one time. While we were towing, and I I lost it in the surf, and it got crashed up on some really gnarly rocks. And I, I was like, well, this will be an interesting experiment. You know, see what happens here. And granted, we had like a couple of puncture wounds in the deck, but nothing too bad. We kept surfing, I pulled it off the rocks, and kept going, kept towing. Wow. And that's, I mean. That's the other thing too, like people don't recognize, like it always looks like a stunt, but like we're actually, we can pull somebody behind us, you know, to, to surf. And that, that says a lot about the durability and, and reliability of the things tough. Like it's got power, the, all the electrical contacts are overbuilt. Like our, you know, our, our motto in here is kind of belt and suspenders. And when we're, when we're designing, it's like, so you, what do you mean by that? Well, cause like if you, if you really get engineer on it, like if you engineers will get like, they'll design precisely to the number that you know needs to be met and stuff and like no man like okay cool let's double that you know let's like oh that's tough like let's make it twice as tough oh that's good power that's enough power let's give it twice as much power you know let's like let's make this thing oh, i want to build it for my old man my old man he's like the destroyer like i'll test it it works okay i'll give it to him and he'll go out and like if, if he can't destroy it if he can't like you know then we're good. And how, how did you not get stuck in the trap of, uh, I know with, in it, with engineers, sometimes they'll, they'll just keep building and building and building, right. And try to perfect it before getting something out there. So how did you overcome that? And how, when did you feel like the EFOIL was ready to go? Like you were, you felt comfortable releasing and putting it out into the world? Well, I'd say a little part there is a pretty big part is, is my old man. Yeah. You know, my dad is like my, my, my counterbalance. He's, he's always got the saying, like, shoot the engineer. 
like as in it's done like let's go but not necessarily on this product it was like hey be cautious you know don't don't put it out until you know you're ready and we we had enough years working in our shop building product that like you know we we had some rough years on a small scale where i put out product that was not ready and it hurt me a lot like you know 2014 is a year that i'll never forget with my kite foils and it was a very small operation but it was a very strong lesson you know what i mean like if you have one detail one detail that's not working properly and like you're just going to see these things coming home to you it's Mm -hmm. like a big problem you know and so with the with the foil i got it to the point you know that i i felt like okay this is this is good this is strong enough like Let's get it out there, you know, and now we're going to now we're going to learn what we're going to learn. We're going to learn the things that we don't know because we need a bigger population of people out riding it. And we'll and what we did as well is we made everything really modular, you know, so we made all components modular so that like things can be replaced and interchanged and we could take care of our customers. Mm -hmm. Granted, like our first year, sure, we had, you know, we had um, our warranty cases and stuff like that. But it was easy to take care of people. They'd be like, hey, I'm just going to swap you a new component of this. And we went updating and fine tuning as we went along. To, to get everybody taken care of and yep. never stuck. Tell me a little bit more about the battery because I know that's obviously the battery is a major Not component of it. Yeah, it's actually a big cost too. We'll talk about price in, in a little bit, but um, you guys outsourced the, the, the development and, and the manufacturing of the battery to another company, right, called Lithos. Yeah, so my, my original partners here uh, are in San Francisco area. Um, young guys, ex-Tesla engineers, um, really, really smart guys, capable and... Um, I, I came to them with the, with the project and said, look, here's what we want to build for a production battery. Actually, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I, I, was, I was in China. I was going to get a battery built in China. I really didn't know much about batteries, you know, not, not a battery engineer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I was kind of looking at it going like, hey, well, these guys really want to build it, and the price looks great. But I was like, I just don't know. And I, I spoke to an expert finally, you know, that was kind of hard to find. And the experts say, did you think about this? I was like, no. Did you think about that? No. Did you think about this? No. And he's like, you know what? You're not ready. Oh, okay, you're yeah. right. I'm not ready. Um, so I had, to, I had to start over on that project. And I had to find some, some guys in the States that were willing to put in the hours. And it was a challenge for them, too. They built some really cool stuff, but it was a challenge. You know, and it took more time than we expected, and um, it took more money than we expected. But we did, we did our absolute best to make it as best as it could, you know, as good as it can be. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've, we've fine-tuned it, we've updated, and we left the door open to, to do those updates and to do, like, you know, like a year later, everybody was getting software updates on their battery that totally changed the performance of their battery packs. You know what I mean? Um, so it was, a, it was an interesting process. And I would say on batteries, you know, like, because now we're moving into a world of battery-powered, and all batteries are not created equal, you know? It's like... I, we definitely take it for granted, you know, we're just like, oh yeah, well, this should work great. Well, like your phone. Yeah. Well, you know. I mean, Apple's a big company, but look at what happened with Samsung. Mm. Yeah. You know, like, and probably on a probably pretty small percentage compared to what they have out there, you know, but still it's, um, it's a tricky technology and it's, it's not easy in there. You can buy a lot of stuff off the shelf, off like the, the Asian market and stuff like that. It is not, it is not qualified or capable for what we're doing out in the water i'll say that mm-hmm. so we've we've definitely taken a different approach again belt and suspenders um to make the best that we can make and we continue to evolve it and improve it as well got it let's talk a little bit about the uh, handheld controller because i know that's one of the aspects that, that was really hard you guys to. had to like basically invent that from scratch i mean no one there was no other product out there that had a wireless hand controller for a motorized like watercraft or surfboard of any kind right when we when we we're out building the prototype. I was searching online for like a waterproof hand controller and I could not find one. I'm like, are you kidding me? There is not in the world of like hand controllers. There's not a waterproof hand controller like that will do what we want it to do. Nothing. So we had to like, you know, I built for the prototypes. I built some, some pretty rough looking things, but I got the job done. And the actual development of our, of our hand controller that we have now was a lot of work. Um, it was one of the largest amounts of work. It was really challenging and the, you know, cause you're, you're working with really sensitive items. Mm-hmm. Like a radio signal is a very low power signal and we're working against the elements again. Cause like radio signals don't travel through water and they especially do not travel through salt water. Right. And then, and carbon fiber where we got carbon fiber boards. Well, carbon fiber is like, it's a shield to signals and stuff. So 
and you want to have this robust connection to your board, right? And you want it like instantaneous. Mm -hmm. So it was like all these things that contradict themselves. It was like big design challenges. Um, but we, yeah, we got it done. And, and you know, again, like the, the focus there, you know, cause you put in years of effort and there's no turning back, right? Or you and get so, to the controller and you're like, oh wait, like. Yeah, you gotta, <laughs> man, you gotta make sure that the, the architecture is right, yeah. right? And so like if our, our hand controller is really focused on um, precision, you know, like you have a wide range of, of throttle response. And like you really, when you're out and you're surfing on this foil, you can feel just how much control you have at your fingertip, which a lot of controllers failed to do. You know, it's like, man, you built this whole controller, but you missed the point. You know what I mean? Like you don't have control. Like on ours, you definitely have control. Not only like control, but control on the low end and control on the high end and everything in between. Oh. Like, you know, you can pick your, you can pick your settings. You can be where you want to be. It took, it took a lot of work, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with what we got and we'll continue to evolve it as well. Yeah, that's awesome. We've definitely seen it. Um, we've reviewed a bunch of electric skateboards over the years. And that's one thing we noticed uh, right away. The difference between some of the, the higher brand ones, like a mm -hmm. boosted board versus a cheaper knockoff brand. The difference was in was in the remote and the software that controls it, right? The the high end ones like a boosted is very smooth acceleration, very smooth braking, mm -hmm. and with the with the cheaper ones, it's kind of, it's it's not the same, right? You get you know too much acceleration and it kind of throws off your balance. Mm -hmm. Same thing with braking, you hit the brake, and it's too fat, too much braking, too quick, and you feel like you're going to get launched off the board. And that's one one thing that's really cool about the e foil. When I remember the first time that I rode it. That was one thing I noticed right off the bat. I'm like, wow, this trigger feels nice. Like, this is great. Like, it would just, and there's multiple settings, right? So one thing that's really cool is you have different modes. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys have been, um, you know, adding more functionality. One thing that's really cool about the eFoil is that you have the ability to update the firmware. So you guys are always putting out updates. And so mm -hmm. I had, when I bought my board, there was only three modes. And then all of a sudden I got an email from Lyft saying, hey, we got a software update coming. There's some more features and functionality. And I updated it. Now I have four modes, right? And so that's pretty cool. Not only that, that, but we, that. more importantly, we changed the resolution and the throttle significantly. Yeah. So like you, and it may not have even been something that you noticed so much, but your body noticed it. Like when you go out and ride it, if you're really in tune, you'd be like, wow, I have a lot more control as I'm going through like the choppy waters. Cause like this throttle resolution improved by like a hundred times. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Nick, I want to ask you about back to the propulsion and the propellers, um, because I know that you guys, as you mentioned, you've made a lot of different propellers in, um, throughout the history of, of kind of the e-foil, mm -hmm. and you've also innovated in propellers. Tell me a little bit more about some of the things you did there. Uh, well, our motors are really cool, and I, I, work with, uh, I work with a gentleman in the United States who's really the best at building motors, and his company is the best for building motors. Um, and that's why I went to them because I, I figured out even their competitors were like, yeah, these guys are the best. Um, so I went over there and I had to like really track him down, but man, the guy is a genius on his motors. And he, he basically, um, he created a really simplified motor for us. So there's no, there are no mechanical components in there except for two ball bearings and some shaft seals. So nothing to break down, right? All these other guys feel like they have to have these gear boxes and stuff like that. They got rid of all that stuff. So it's, and the motor, man, it's small. And it packs a punch. I mean, like I said, we can pull, I can pull another surfer, like another foiler behind me. And we, I pull them through 10, 15 foot surf and whip them onto a wave, you know? So there's a lot of power coming out of that little brushless motor, but it's really the highest quality brushless motor on the market. Yeah. For those of you that are not familiar with, um, with hydrofoiling and, and, and all this. So basically what Nick is describing, and we'll, we'll put a video of this, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, but for those of you listening, this whole concept of towing another surfer. I mean, they've been doing this with jet skis, mm -hmm. but now these guys are doing it with uh, an e-foil towing a non-motorized foil, right? Yeah, and I mean, we could talk about that for hours right. because it's really my favorite thing to do with the e-foil is, is the utility of it because like, yeah, jet skis are annoying, right? Yeah. And um, nobody wants to see that stuff out in the lineup, but the foil, the e-foil is quiet and silent, so I'm not bugging anybody and I can launch it anywhere I want. So I go to this pretty wild surf break we throw in the e-foil, tie a little rope to the back, and we're catching waves. We're not catching waves where you regularly catch a wave. We're catching waves out at sea. And now we're like, we're doubling, tripling the ride time, and we're going so fast. So like what we're doing with the e-foil towing, like right now everybody's like, oh, that's cool, it's a little stunt. That's gonna transform the world of surfing mm -hmm. because it has opened us, like it's opened up um, this wide range of surfing. 
And it's cool too because like I'm actually taking people that are not surfers, they're learning how to foil on the e-foil, and then I'm teaching them how to surf on the surf foil behind the e-foil, right? It's all translating and they're getting it. Next thing you know, I'm towing them into the surf and they're like, they're ripping past all the traditional surfers. They've never surfed a day in their life. Yeah. But like, you know, it takes some time to get there, but it's a, it's like a whole separate sport, you know? Yeah. That's interesting. There's an interesting aspect of it. And I was asking Nick earlier, you know, because I've never surfed before and I've never hydrofoiled before, but now, now that I know how to ride my e-foil and I've progressed on that, I feel like some of this stuff translates. I feel like I could go and learn surfing and some of the skills that I've learned, the, some of the confidence, some of the stabilizer muscles that are in your legs that you're using when you're foiling, I feel like can translate back to not only surfing, but also uh, foiling. I feel like I could, I feel like I could go and get towed behind and actually start to learn how to, you know, how to foil, regular foil, um, based on the experience that I've had with the e-foil, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it certainly, it, it adds into your overall balance, your focus, right? Your breathing. Um, it's a, it's a great step into those new sports. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to learn a lot from the e-foil and it's like, cause if you were going to try and learn how to surf on a foil right away, it's going to be a very challenging experience. And we knew that that's why we got into this product. Like we knew that we were very limited on the amount of people that could actually do this. We were flying a kite to, to pull ourselves, you know, it was hard to fly a kite and balance yourself on a foil. Yeah. That's really interesting because you would think, you would think the opposite, right? You would think, oh, before I get into something like an e-foil and a motorized, I'd start with the non, non-motorized. But in this case, the other it's, way around. it's the other way around, which yeah, is the, pretty the, fascinating. The electric propulsion, like it stabilizes everything and it gives you total control over your craft. Um, and it acts as like another point of leverage as well to balance it. So it's, it's really, it's why we're getting so many people up and riding you know, it's, it's been a huge success and we kind of got lucky on it, to be honest with you. I, I just didn't even think it was going to be that easy. Um, but it's a, it's a huge success. And at the same time, what makes it successful is that it's a lot of fun. So not only is it like, not only can I get people going that are just getting into the sport or like aren't surfers, but like you hand it over to a professional and they're loving it too. Yeah. It's awesome. I got to say for the RE foil, um, we've had it for, you know, all last summer. And it, it's, it was pretty fascinating, the amount of people that were really interested in trying it out. Um, so for example, my wife, she, you know, snowboarded, uh, historically, and she was able to get up on it and, and foil on her first try. I mean, it was, it was pretty amazing of how quickly she picked it up. Other people, it takes them a little bit longer, but what's interesting is even for my family, my older brother, he doesn't do any kind of board sports whatsoever. I mean, he's not a surfer. He's not a, you know, never been on a skateboard. And he would call me on the weekends and say, hey, Greg, are you going to be at the lake? I want to e-foil. Like, yeah. Wow, that's surprising. Let's do it. Um, even my dad, right, in, in his early 60s, like he, you know, he used to windsurf when he was younger. And when we got this thing, I mean, he's like, I got to figure this out. I want to do it. And it took him a little bit longer, right, because he's being a little more careful. He doesn't want to get hurt um, and take his time and progress. But he's getting good at it. And it's amazing, you know, how far the reach is for a product like this and how many different types of people are really intrigued by it and, and really want to try it. Right. It's right. pretty cool. Um, but let's talk about a little bit more about the community. Cause I know there's a, the community is growing and there's a lot of riders out there. Right. And you mentioned, right. Some pro surfers and there's snowboarders and athletes. Tell us a little bit about some of the people that are, that are riding the, uh, the e-foil. Uh, we've, we've got a lot. Um, we've got a lot of people that are, that are pretty stoked on it. I mean, and I, and I, I like to see that too, because you know, my goal was to build a product that the average person can use and achieve and we've we've definitely achieved that and then at the same time i want to make sure that i have a product that everybody's really excited about because i want to be excited about it right so like i build something for myself and we do we have like you know the kai lenny he's a, he's just the ripper on the foiler he's he's loving it um laird hamilton who i who i look up to a lot really interesting guy he was the godfather of foiling um, he loves his, his e-foil when he's out in Malibu and it's, you know, flat surf. Um, you got then like into the snowboarding realm, um, like Travis Rice, he, he enjoys his foil when he's off season and he's ripping around. He loves, he loves the way that it carves turn. Uh, you got John, John Florence, who's the champion of surfing. He loves to put his folding prop on his e-foil and go out and catch some waves. So I'm like, well, that's, you know, that says something. If the world champion of surfing likes surfing on his e-foil. I guess it's pretty fun, right? 
And you got even people like, um, you know, Lewis Hamilton, who's like the champion of Formula One uh, race cars. He loves his E-foil. Mm -hmm. You know, so you got a lot of people out there that are, that are supreme athletes, um, always looking for a thrill, and they love it. And at the same time, yeah, it's like you got your dad, you got your old man. He loves it. He yeah. likes going down to the lake. So it's for everybody, you know. And then you're also getting a lot of, um, you, I mean, it, it makes great content, right? So you see this thing and you film it and everyone's always asking, like, how does it work? It looks super cool. And so you, now you have these influencers, like, that are, starting to, that are starting to do it. So Will Smith tried it. He made a video about mm -hmm. it. Um, you've got re just recently Brody Jenner just posted a video of, mm -hmm. uh, of him on, on one. Then you've got people like Casey Neistat. I mean, Casey mm -hmm. used to live in New York City, and he, he's kind of famous for putting boosted boards on the map, mm -hmm. right? Because he would just rip around New York on his boosted board and make videos all day about it. Now he actually transplanted, and he's over in California. And what did he get? He got an e-foil, right? So mm -hmm. he's going to be, you know, he's making videos about that now. And so... I think we're in the midst of seeing a lot more content too on YouTube. I think once that, that hits and everyone says, I got to have one, you know, it turns into like a, a rush, right? Of, of I, I've been watching videos for, this is what happens. People go down the rabbit hole right. and you start watching videos. And after looking at it for months and months, I mean, it, it, you know, the, the bug bites oh, and then you yeah, got to buy well, one. And, and people now, you know, like when I go to trade shows and stuff, I mean, people go, oh, I've seen that before cool so we got we got stage one was like introduction visual introduction like getting people to watch it right mm -hmm. and like you say you got these influencers now they're posting more videos and stuff and so now there's there's more content out there and be like oh i've seen that before it's so awesome it's so cool and then you get but you know the next challenge is people go well i don't know if i can do that myself right and you go oh yeah you can and you will right and so as you get more people as you get more product out there in the market and more regular people riding it because when, you know, your friends are going to come up and be like, oh, I did it. It's so cool. You got to try it. Of course you can do it. Now it's somebody that they trust, somebody that they know. And they're like, okay, okay, I'm going to go do it. And they're going to look up like our, you know, our affiliate uh, map, uh, all the different locations that they can go out and try it. Right now we got over 120 locations and growing, right? And they're going to go out and ride it for themselves and try it. And then they're going to be in. And it's going to blow up like a wildfire because we know that it's a lot of fun and mm -hmm. it's super addicting. I mean, yeah. I've been addicted to this for 10 years, yeah. like addicted, yeah. you know, it's my whole life is into this stuff. And I love my sports. I love activities. Foiling is like where it's at. Yeah. And know? that's cool. It's cool that there, we're starting to see more places where you can kind of fly before, like try before you buy it. Right. Yeah. It's and and that, experience it. Yeah. And that's really cool. But now there's even uh, rentals. Right. And that, that's really cool because you know, one of the, the first questions that people ask when they see the e-foil, mm -hmm. the first question is, where'd you get that? How much does it cost? Yeah. Right. And, and it's expensive, right? So the retail price on this is $12,000. Right. And so it's not, you know, it's not for people that are looking to spend a couple hundred bucks, right? This is an investment, right? Yep. So um, what's interesting though, is people always are very surprised at how much it costs. They look at it and they think, oh, it's a surfboard with a motor on it. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. it costs a couple thousand bucks at most, but then you tell them the price pack price point and they're freaking out right so tell us a little bit more about that why is it so expensive well i mean the first question is like is it that expensive right yeah. because like you know i have when i was in the kiting uh and like racing i had a quiver bag that was well over twelve thousand dollars a gear you know just to go to a race um and if you're into golfing how much does your golf quiver actually mm -hmm. cost you quite a bit of money and your membership plus, every plus year your membership and all the your, your beer tab yeah um you know, same thing. I could go down the list with all sorts of sports, even even probably climbing. You know, that's like the guys living out of their vans. I thought that they got some quite a bit of gear. Yeah. Or if you're in the camera stuff, you like the photography and stuff. How much cameras are costing? So things are, you know, nice things are expensive. Yeah, you can't give it a phone these days. I mean, a phone is a thousand bucks just to get a good phone, at least. Yeah, a, for a new phone. And that's a that's a simple. Oh, well, I wouldn't say it's a simple item. It's quite complex. But they're, you know, everybody has a phone, so it's right. a whole different level of manufacturing. This is a this is a, a, a smaller production product, you know, all custom built, all custom made and quality components. Like, so like, you know, people go, oh, I could buy a jet ski for that. I go, yeah, you could buy a jet ski, but you know, I have a jet ski and it's in our yard. We use it about three times a year. And every mm -hmm. time we pull it out, I have problems with it because it's cheap casted metals and a fiberglass hole. There's really nothing to it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not much in there and it's heavy, it's big. You need does a trailer. That, does so does you need big? A truck? Yeah, does big equal more expensive? Is that how it works? Like, it's it's ours is more compact. Ours is actually more challenging. Yeah. You know, for um, that 
for engineering wise and design wise and component wise and really we use ours every single day yeah that's interesting because there's this kind of this ratio right of of uh, how much you use something so the jet ski is a, a, right. a great example right you buy a jet ski and you're already spending right. 10 grand for a jet ski Plus. then yep yeah, more then you're buying a trailer then you need a truck. You need the right car to to haul it. You're only you using need four it. people to get it in out of the water. Yeah, you yeah. need you need you need that. You need you're spending money on gas. Um, it's noisy. It's, it's not noisy. that fun. Yeah, and you then don't actually you actually don't really go out and use it that often. You got to winterize do, it, right? And some people are really into jet skis, right? I mean, if you love jet skis and you got two great. of them and you're riding them all the time and you have a dock and you all that, you should get an e-foil because you're really gonna love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's interesting because people don't think about the ratio of. Like the e-foil is so dollars per fun. Yeah, it's so easy. I mean, you can and and also you mentioned a good point, portability. Mm -hmm. You the whole thing breaks down. So when you see this thing, right, and it's got, you know, the mast on it and everything, it you know it looks pretty pretty big and tall. But everything everything like Nick said, it's modular and couple, everything couple takes a screws, couple take, screws, everything pull takes apart. pull apart. You guys include a case when you buy this thing. Mm -hmm. You get actually a bunch of cases, which they're actually nice cases. I gotta I gotta tell you, you guys yeah. did a good job on. Maybe uh, you don't get enough credit for for that. I mean, it's like a rugged case. You have a case for everything, all the components. Um, and that's nice. And so you can put it in the, in the back of your car. You can, you can ride it on a lake. You can bring it to a river. You can bring it to the ocean. I mean, you can bring this thing around and, and, and also explore, which is really cool. You can yep. explore new places that, you know, try, try bringing a jet ski on a place that doesn't allow, you know, gas powered, yeah. uh, motorized, um, you know, boats and things. Yeah. You can't. No, right, you're protected you're, you're areas getting, now. You're investing into an experience and you really get to use it a lot. It's no maintenance. You're just fresh water rinse. And really, you know, like that's, you ask like, why, why does it cost that price? That's what it needs to be priced at in order to get a quality product that you can rely on. Because anything less is really not going to last you and you're just going to be very disappointed in its performance and its, its longevity. And that's what, you know, like we've really we put in not only just the best components because we want to put in the best components, we put in the best components because it's a requirement, it's a necessity. And we've made sure that like the experience out on the foil is like the experience that we want to have that we're proud of, you know, and that's, that's what you're really buying into. And they hold up, you know, that that's an investment, like you say, and it holds its investment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's worth it. Yeah, it's totally worth it. So where do you think, um, obviously you guys are the first, and um, I want to ask you a little bit about patents because I know you have a handful of patents on some mm -hmm. of this stuff. Um, and so I want you to t tell us a little bit more about kind of these patents and how you guys are seeing like the overall market and the industry mm -hmm. because there's other players that are getting involved. There's other competition. They want to bring the price point lower. People are mm -hmm. trying to bring this thing down and try to sell it for five grand. I mean, where, mm -hmm. where are we going with that? And is that even feasible? Uh, well, so patent wise, I mean, we designed we designed everything from scratch and and this time around you know because like i said we did our surf stuff and we did our kite stuff and you know i see kind of how the industry works it just goes oh me too me too me too you know they'll take it and try to replicate it and so this time around we said look we're going to put a lot of money and time and original thinking into this so let's let's protect what we build and that's what we did and we have we have some really solid patents around our product um and it's not necessarily to keep everybody out of the industry um, it's just we're protecting what we have and we've offered even some licensing agreements to other companies that want to use our architecture mm -hmm. um, that we've put together um, and yeah I mean so some people yeah they might they might better it and and bring the cost down I'm sure that we will too to, to come in and say oh I'm gonna build one for five thousand dollars yeah right you know like not this product you're not gonna wave a magic wand and um, and just pull that off you know like we're we're aware of the global market. We're aware of Asian manufacturing. We're there, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're building stuff there too. Like we're, we're sourcing components. We, we source components where they need to be sourced from, you know, depending on quality and cost and stuff. So we're like, we're very conscious, cost conscious. And we're also very conscious too with our, um, our margin structure within our business. Cause we recognize that we need to build a, a network of, of affiliates and representatives out there to take care of all their customers and, and grow it. And those people need to be compensated as well, um, but we've we've even designed our own structure for that. So to not to keep the cost down, like if we followed a traditional structure, cost would be through the roof. Yeah, I know? think it's important to protect the industry. If you, you know, the last thing you want is someone to go out and build a, a, a cheaper version of this and and not do it well and have one of these like blow up, right? I mean, look at Tesla and electric cars, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, consumers are very um, mindful of the fact that you you know you'll you'll tell people oh a Tesla and they're like yeah but you know if you crash those they'll blow up yeah it's true the batteries are 
you know, delicate and, and they can, you know, catch fire and it's dangerous. Right. And there's, so there's a lot of components that you just need to be careful mm -hmm. and not let, you know, just anyone kind of build these. Right. I mean, you want to make sure that when someone says e-foil, they don't think of, you know, something bad. You want them to think of this awesome product with a great experience. Right. Right. Yeah. You want people putting in, you know, you want them to have the right design philosophy. Um, and when you can see stuff on the outside structure that you're like, oh, I don't know about that. Well, that's probably how the inside is built too. Mm. Right. The things that you can't see. Mm. And so that's, you know, we're, we've really with our patents too, we are trying to, cause we've been building the market. We've been creating this market. We've created the product. We're creating the market and we're trying to protect that market as well. We're trying to protect our hard work. And so the people that come in with that, you know, shady, uh, construction, scram, bud, you know, yeah. like don't like just go back, fix it, re, you know, do, do yourself a favor because that thing's your business going to come crashing down. Right. Do yourself a favor, go back and do another iteration and just do it right. And don't worry about the price just right. Just do it properly and then see where it kind of prices out at and then come back in here so we can build the market together properly because, and it's not just that it's not just dangerous. You know, it's, it's, it's like what, what somebody has experienced when they go out and try it. You don't mm -hmm. want them to spend even $5,000. You spend five grand and you go out and be like, oh, that thing broke down, doesn't work, this and that. You're bummed, you know, like yeah. you want to be happy. No, I mean, if you've been listening to this podcast, then you have heard the amount of uh, R&D and work that's gone into it. I mean, there's a reason why it costs this much. And I think Nick and his company, they're very mindful of this, of creating an amazing product with a great experience. Um, Nick, tell me a little bit more about where we're heading. I mean, I think you guys have been doing this for a long time mm -hmm. and obviously you'll be here for a long time. I mean, where, where, how do you think about, about just electric watercrafts, right? I mean, it starts with the e-foil. I know there's people are starting to make like electric jet skis and electric boats. There's mm -hmm. an electric hydrofoil boat. I think right. it's called Candela right. um, that I've checked out. I mean, where, where are we heading with all this stuff? Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's just about to kick off and get exciting, you know? Um, electric propulsion across the board for me is a favorite. Like it, w as soon as you dive into it, you're like, you're done with the gas engines because they just don't have the same kind of response that electric propulsion does. So like be it on a skateboard, a boat, uh, a bike, a car, you know, maybe even airplanes coming up, right? Like that's going to be the way to travel when you get rid of all that noise and stuff too. It's just super cool. And in our world of hydrofoils, now you've done the electric propulsion you get this thing up off the water and it's flying like whoa what a this is cool you know this is a great sensation so it, it's really kind of funny that i mean those those topics are they're kind of behind schedule yeah you know they're behind schedule and we're about to see a boom in in all those products and i think everything is going to be reinvented and, and restructured and it, it'll take some time and like you say you know like um can you can you electrify a boat? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can electrify a boat. Like, but right now, like maybe you need to change the concept of what that boat needs to do. Yeah. Right. Like, like does it have to go sixty miles an hour? I don't know. How often do you go sixty miles an hour in a boat? Not that often. Like that's fast. You know, does it have to go that fast? Probably not. You yeah. know, like, um, or maybe like you look at the wakeboarding, like the wake surfing boats. Well, they need a lot of weight anyway, and they're going slow. So maybe you just add some batteries, batteries in there and then like now you're not huffing fumes while you're back there surfing the wave, right? It's actually, it would be a much more pleasant experience. Yeah, it's one thing that, that, that's pretty interesting. I saw recently, um, you know, they're also starting to come out with electric snowmobiles and mm -hmm. I saw a fact that snowmobiles pollute a ton. People don't realize, it's kind of interesting because you think about these, these products like, you know, jet skis and snowmobiles and you're out mm -hmm. in the wilderness and people say, you know, I it's love noise taking pollution too. Yeah. And it's not and just, it's not, it's not just emissions, it's noise pollution. Yeah. yeah. And you take these out in the wilderness and people are like, yeah, I love riding the back country and doing this and, you know, and maybe they're not being conscious enough about, yeah, noise pollution and the just pollution in general and, you know, of some of these products, but, um, well, and the batteries are going to get way better. They're improving year over year. Right. Like, and the more, the more focus that we have on that industry, the better it's going to get the faster. Like, so those batteries are going to get smaller, more powerful, and they're going to get a lot safer too. You know, right now, um, the chemistries uh, can be a little dangerous. It takes a lot of tech, uh, technology to keep them safe. Um, pretty soon, you know, the, the guy who invented the lithium battery, who's like 96 years old, he just reinvented the battery again. Or like with a, it's like a solid state, no, you know, non-flammable, like really impressive. I mean, my hat's off to that guy. He's mm -hmm. still going for it. 
Um, but it, and that's in a lab, right? And that'll trickle down into mainstream production. And it's going to be really exciting. Yeah, that, what we do with our batteries. That's how you know that we're onto something big here, just as 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 a whole. You know, all these different industries and with batteries. I mean, it's amazing how far these products have come. Whether it's an electric car, whether it's a lift e-foil, with what we have today. I mean, these batteries mm-hmm. are still pretty big. They're still pretty heavy, and you're able to build an electric hydrofoil. I can only imagine, you know, what you guys will be able to build later on when you have even more power and lighter and et cetera. So I'm super excited, you you'll, know, to, you'll, to you'll be able be to back here next year to, yeah. to unveil all the fun stuff that we've been looking at. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're on it. I mean, we're, this is not a one trick pony. Um, we're, we're building some really cool stuff. I mean, for me, you know, my thing is, um, I get really excited about innovation and, and creating new products and I, I just need to find the new thrill for, for myself, you know? So I get, I get some of these ideas in my head and I'm just like, I got to build one, you know, I got to make this thing. And so like we, we dive in deep and we've actually, we've got some really exciting stuff that shows true evolution in the product. And, and it's fun for consumers, right? Because like, you're going to get into the product and you're going to get like, I get the question all the time. Like, Hey Nick, what's next? What else you got for me? I'm like, gosh, I just delivered this one to you. But like, okay, here, I got something for you. Yeah. Try this. Come back to me in a couple of weeks. Um, so we're, we're, we'll keep it rolling for sure. It's like, like you said, it's an investment, you know, like you're, you're getting into something that you're going to spend time with and like, you're going to get good at it. And like, we're just going to keep feeding you that excitement, like, you know, one piece at a time and it's going to change your life. Yeah. We, and we love it. And we're, we're so happy to be here and get a chance to uh, experience it and also show the world. I mean, what this product's all about and hopefully everyone who's listening today to this podcast, hopefully you got an, a good understanding of you know, what this amazing product's all about and how it's built and all the, the time and R and D that went into it. Um, I think it's amazing and we're super stoked to see kind of what you guys are going to come up with next. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nick. Thanks a lot for listening and be sure to uh, subscribe and we'll be putting out some more podcasts in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks.